And now we're shifting really into how to become a strategic and effective advisor. And so um, Patty Burroughs is going to come up here and she's all about driving tech transformation at speed and scale. I love her. She's really the managing director at Accenture and she's the Midwest FS tech delivery leader. Let's bring her up. Patty, how are you doing? Glad to see you. I hope you're going to have well. a great time. Great to hear what you have to say. Thank you for being here. Awesome. Thanks for the great welcome, Patty. Hi, everybody. It's just wonderful to be here. Uh, so I, I first just want to start by acknowledging that, and Megan said it herself, the um, trust in any relationship is just foundational. It could be your marriage. It could be your girl gang, your colleagues and clients. Um, but of course, it's very important as it relates to advisor and advisee relationships. And frankly, trust is complicated and it's difficult to build. Again, Megan had some examples where she wasn't doing anything you know, wrong um, and yet was uh, having difficulty building that trust. So I'm really glad that we have this framework and some practice in doing so today. Um, I have another component. Megan mentioned it. I was glad she did um, that I always think about in this trust kind of equation. So when you add reliability and honesty and competence and compassion to yield trust, remember that there can be a subtraction factor and that is your self-interest meaning the greater your self-orientation is in that relationship, that will lower the amount of trust. So I'm going to tell just a couple stories today about trust in advisor relationships and then hopefully leave you with a few takeaways to apply. Um, so I'm going to first talk about advising um, some of my folks on their careers, right? And I always go back to that self-interest component. So I had an employee once that wanted to follow another career path. Um, she asked for my advice, um, but she had a very important role in my team and a very moody client and her leaving was going to be very painful and difficult for me personally. I just had to take that out of the equation and advise her properly. So she, you know, talked through her concerns and desires and options she was looking at. And ultimately I advised her to take another role. Um, and that was like five years ago. And we continue to share a relationship and frankly advise each other. And I really attribute that to the high level of trust that we built through that one interaction. So now we'll flip the coin. I have another example. Um, there was a gentleman on my team and I was advising him on what to do differently. And frankly, he just wasn't taking my advice. He was you know, falling on deaf ears. So I sat down with him and I'm like, look, I don't feel like you're listening or applying any of my feedback. And finally, after I shut my big mouth and allowed him to speak, I realized I was advising him to take a path that he was not interested in taking. I assumed really that he wanted to take on more responsibility and get promoted and whatever like I did, but he didn't. So another key here is to be clear on expectations of what advice they want from you. Um, and it's not just telling them what they want to hear. You can disagree and don't sugarcoat, but a strong trust-based relationship really does still have to be founded on what the advisee is really looking for in an outcome. Um, so from there, me and him, you know, we had a very strong trust-based relationship, but we really just had to get on the same page. So that's also very important. Um, so I have one last story, and this is more about business advice with a client. Uh, it's a short story, but I think it's a good one and hopefully resonates with you. Um, I had a client several years back who I basically advised not to do something, not to give me business. And at first she's like, you know, really annoyed and almost upset with me because I wasn't going to go help her do something that she wanted to do. And honestly, to this day, she still talks about it. She introduces me in that way, like, oh, this is the girl who wouldn't let me, you know, wouldn't take my business or whatever. Um, and I, I give it right back to her. I say, look, what about all the great things I did do for you? You only talk about this one thing. But I think that just really reinforces that at that moment, she realized I was advising her with the right intent and that I didn't have that self-interest component in mind. So um, I know this is a short segment. Hopefully a couple of those experiences resonate with you guys. Um, I'm going to conclude with just two takeaways um, for what I've done to help um, strengthen myself as a strategic advisor. The first one's um, obvious. I've said it a couple of times. It is not about you. You need to talk less, listen more, and understand the advisee's objectives. And the second one is about um, having a teachable point of view. Uh, it goes back to what is the rock component? Competence. Yeah. Um, you can't really advise on something you've not mastered yourself. Right. And in my line of work as a consultant, I thought I was expected to be an expert at everything. And clearly that isn't going to build trust with my clients. So, you know, I often hear myself say, you know, Mrs. Client, 
I just heard my colleague from another company talk about their experience with that. You know, why don't we all get together? And that builds trust so much more than me pretending to advise and giving some flat, you know, slide where story. So I guess the advice there is I am constantly learning, getting certified, trying things out, gaining that experience, reading, absorbing um, all those things so that I can expand my advisory skills. You can teach an old dog new tricks. I'm proof of that. Um, so that is my second recommendation is make sure you not only uh, create that teachable, teachable point of view, but continue to grow that over time. So guys, thanks for having me. I always love the WIC events and I always leave feeling, you know, like I take some nuggets away and get some new energy and empowerment. Um, I'm really thankful to be on stage with you today. Um, and I'm trying to take some, some uh, cues from Chai. She always brings up some great quotes. Uh, I'm definitely more of a song person than a quote person. So I selected a song lyric to laugh, um, but you know the song Count On Me by Bruno Mars? I feel like that's a perfect song about trust in a relationship. And the quote is, we find out what we're made of when we are called to help our friends in need. And the reason I bring that up is being an advisor really brings a great deal of joy to me and pride. So maybe there is a little something in it for me. So thanks guys, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks Patty. Okay, fantastic. I love it. Now, uh, I'm going to bring up Tucker Stein because he's going to come in, share some tips on more tips on leadership. And so um, if you don't know who Tucker Stein is, he's just an amazing, amazing person. So Tucker Stein really, you know, he worked for other people and then he started his own branding company and he's really fantastic. He does TEDx coaching. I used him as a coach for some of my students. They loved working with him because he just really knows how to turn personal stories to help you, um, you know, give shape to your brand. Thanks so much, Tucker. Can't wait to hear what you have to say. Thank you, Patty. Appreciate the introduction and thank you so much for having me today. Um, I wanted to share something real quick before I jumped in here. Um, I had the opportunity to sit down with my 75 year old father yesterday and I walked him through what I was going to talk about today. And I think for the first time ever, he said, son, I think I just learned something from you about how to be a dad. And I wanted to pass that along because we've talked a little bit about relationships today, way more than just business relationships, but how we show up for other people. And that's what I want to talk about today, specifically from the angle of, your personal brand, your story, and trusted advisorship. So if you wouldn't mind, Raisa, going to the first slide. Specifically, I want everyone to think about your story. Uh, we hear a lot about this, and there's a difference between telling a story and storytelling. Telling a story is chronology, it's facts, it's for entertainment value, but storytelling is really about how we share the experiences and stories we've had over time that help create human impact. And I wanted you to think about advisorship from a different perspective today. Less about necessarily just guiding someone or giving advice or leading them down a path, but think about how you can open them up to new kinds of experiences about themselves. So you, the way you connect with others through your story and your experiences, that is your personal brand. And oftentimes your personal brand can drive a lot, a lot of networking and great business relationships. Um, so let's go on to the next slide. So, Really, the power of story creates three things, three key things that I believe to be true. We've talked a little bit about this today. Relatability, you know, how we talked a little bit about, you know, when, you, when you're walking into the room and you're meeting an advisor for the first time and you're, you know, getting into some of these topics and, you know, making that connection can sometimes be awkward. Vulnerability, don't be afraid to be vulnerable and use your stories as an opportunity to level the playing field. Sometimes there's this this awkwardness or this gap between the advisor and the advisee, at the end of the day, we are people too. We're all people. Uh, we've, we've tend to strip down a little bit of that humanity in the technology, and we focus a lot, a lot on features and benefits. Don't forget to focus on the story too, and that ultimately builds trust, and we've talked a lot about trust today. Next, Teresa. So I want you to think about something. I want you to pretend that you're an advisee, and I want you to walk into a room and you have an opportunity to choose an advisor. Now, person A on the left or person B on the right. And on the left, I have to put my glasses on here. Um, 
someone's talking about their their business degree, where they went to school, um, how many years have they been in the business uh, of marketing, um, that they own their own business, they become an entrepreneur, uh, they manage multi million dollar budgets, and they talk a lot about what they do, right? Not necessarily who they are. Person B on the right, happily married for 20 plus years, has two beautiful kids, dedicates time to, to serving first responders and firefighters, mentors inmates inside prison, suffers from anxiety, um, and dedicates their career to helping others create global change. Now I asked the question of both of, or of all of you, which one would you wanna sit down in as an advisor? Go ahead and put that in the chat. Person A or person B? Now, let me just tell you something. That person A and person B are the exact same person. And that person happens to be me. So look what happens when you think about the kind of way in which you approach advisorship or the way in which you connect with someone based upon what you're looking for. Now, a couple of you have said before, it will depend upon the context. Yes, it depends upon the context, but in theory, let's, let's take this as a global practice. You're looking for someone that you can connect with. So let's go on to the next slide. So I often get asked, you know, when you sit down and, and you're an advisor and you're in this role and, and, and maybe you've got more than one mentee or depends upon, you know, how many people that you have, where do you start? How do you start the conversation? And when Chaitra and I were talking, she had asked me to put together, are there a series of questions, Tucker, that you specifically ask that seem to get the most out of your uh, advisorship? And this is where I start. So I call this the pivotal starting point. Question one, where are your current pain points at the moment? When you talk about the pain first and you talk about where the challenges are, that also creates trust. It also shows them that you know where they're at, right? So start with where they are currently at. If you don't get to their level or understand where they're at, it's gonna be a very, very challenging dynamic. The second, what is specifically blocking access to resolve those issues? And oftentimes it isn't necessarily the solution that they need help with, it's the access that's specifically blocking them to that solution. And oftentimes advisorship can be literally breaking down that, that wall that exists between the two. Third, what's working, what's not? As much as it's important to talk about what's not working and get to the problem, it's also important to know what is working because oftentimes that capitalizes on their own, what I call zone of genius, where their strengths are. Because if you understand their strengths at the same time, you're gonna be able to address what's not working. Fourth, what does success look like to you? And when I say you, meaning the, the advisee or the mentee. Success in your eyes, and we've talked a little bit about this, and I, and, you know, I, I think Patty just addressed this. Your success of that individual isn't necessarily the way they vision their, their success. So make sure that you understand what they believe to be success for themselves. And then finally, what can I do to advocate for that success, right? What can I do? I'm not trying to solve the problem, but what can I do to advocate for that vision of success? And then finally, Raisa, the slide. This is what I like to call the rule of rapport and some things to think about um, as an advisor that often I've had to learn my own lessons. And I will tell you, this is the slide where my dad went, hmm, interesting. And he's reflecting back on his own on his own parenting style. Listen versus speak. That is such a powerful one. There is this human nature to want to solve and fix, which is which is actually the next one, um, that we want to fix it. We want it, we want to be there and do something important. Listen first before speaking. Way more powerful. Advocate versus fix. Don't try to fix the problem, right? Don't you know, do the fishing yourself, teach them how to fish. Uh, they need to understand and learn the tools, which is what leads into my next one, micro versus macro. There's a tendency to stay really, really high and not enough really, really on the ground. Sometimes advisorship gets into the minutia of small things that are gonna equal way bigger successes. Too caught up in the macro things, most often or not, they're looking for micro advances in what they need to do. And encourage versus lead. They're the ones that are going to lead themselves. All you're doing is encouraging the path in which they're going to take. Same thing, theory versus practice. 
sometimes when we stay too much in theory and we don't allow them to practice, then we're actually not solving the problem. We're actually removing the problem from them and they're gonna come back to you over and over again with the same problem. So this is what I call the rule of rapport. All of these kinds of practices really help develop a really solid trusted advisory relationship. And I'll always go back to and say, don't be afraid to use the power of storytelling in order to create an impactful relationship. And with that, I'll turn it back for, uh, thank you for having me today. Tucker, I just love those tips. I love all of them. I was like frantically capturing the last ones, right? But that's fantastic. Thank you so much for all those things. That, and in a nutshell, those are really at the heart of great conversation with anybody. So that I love about building rapport.